Hello, everybody. If you have just joined us, please type in your name, your role, and where you're coming from, what your SAU is, your CDS site, your regional center, wherever you're joining us from, please just drop that in chat because we really like to see who joins us. And in the chat, there are also some versions of the PowerPoint itself, one that has some space for you to take notes if you want, and then another that just has the PowerPoint itself. So feel free to download that. So we have had lots and lots of requests for more information on writing measurable functional goals versus outcome-based. So that's what we're going to talk about today. This is a little bit different. If you've joined us for this topic before, this one is just a little bit different. We made some tweaks because we wanted to try to clarify some questions that have come up. So hopefully this will work for everybody. Um, we are a larger group today. There's quite a few people registered today. So if you have questions, drop them in chat. And we have people monitoring the chat box. They'll respond if they need to stop me they'll stop me. If for some reason, however, you need me to stop immediately because I'm moving too quickly, you can't hear me, you need me to repeat something in the moment, just come off of mute and let me know that. This training is for you. We want it to work. So uh, feel free to, to, to make that happen, okay? So let's get started. Introductions. Well, we're going to introduce our team in just one minute. And again, please plop in chat who you are, where you're coming from, and what your role is, please. We're going to talk about outcome-based goals. I have some examples. We're going to talk about them from the academic perspective as well as functional. And then we've just got some review. So this is my team. My name is Colette Sullivan. I am the federal programs coordinator. I get to work with this exceptionally talented team. If you've joined us before, you've heard our spiel. I worked as a special ed teacher for almost 30 years, primarily with students with autism, joined the department about five years ago, and um, I'm very happy to be here with you. Jennifer is not with us today. However, Carly is. So Carly, can you come on real quickly and say hello, please? I thought I unmuted, but I did not. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Carly Thibodeau. Uh, I joined the team in the department about a year and a half ago. And before that, I was a teacher for 21 years. Carly and Ashley is here. Ooh. Hi, everybody. We're having trouble with our mute buttons today. Um, I'm Ashley Satry, and I joined the team about seven months ago. And before I joined the DOE, I was a teacher, a special ed teacher, um, in Maine and Virginia for 14 years, and I am having some internet connection trouble. So if I pop out, I will try to pop back in. <laughs> okay, thanks, Lee. And Julie is here. Hi. Hi, I'm Julie Pelletier. Um, I've been with the DOE. I'm in my sixth year. And um, prior to that, I was admin support at a K-5 elementary school for 16 years. Fantastic. So that's our team. Very proud of this team and very proud to work with this team. Our contact information is there as well. So please feel free to reach out to us at any time if you have questions or comments or you just want to uh, get something clarified. Feel free to do that. Before we start, one thing that we always want you to think about and really remember is that all students are general education students first, right? Even though the student might be in a special education setting for a good portion of their day, they are gen ed students first because we are always working towards movement back to the general education setting, right? So always remember to think about them that way. With that said, our goal as special educators is always to work on teaching our students reading skills, math skills, writing skills, behaviors, work skills, making sure that their attendance, making sure that all of those skills are commensurate with their peers, right? Now, I know that for some students, that's a heavier lift than it is for others. As I mentioned, I used to work with students with autism, and many of my students spent a good portion of their day with me. They were not in the gen ed setting for much, 
However, my goal was always to facilitate movement back there, right? I always wanted to think about what components of the gen ed settings could they participate in and have some success with. So always think about it from that, from that angle, okay? So when we start from that place, I think it helps us to remember and it makes it a little bit easier to sort of consider outcomes as age appropriate expectations, okay? And really remembering that we want all students to meet those expectations. Again, some students are going to get there much quicker than others. For some students, it's going to be much easier to get there, but all students, that's what we want for all of our students. So think about those outcomes. If you have a student who is unable to demonstrate those activities that I outlined on that very first slide, you know, those reading skills commensurate to grade level, those behavior skills commensurate to grade level. If they're unable to demonstrate those activities or those skills, your goal is always to try to figure out why, right? And that's what we do. That's what we do all day long. Why can't they read? Why can't they be fluent with their math facts? Why are they tantruming? Why don't they attend? We're always trying to figure that out. So when you're thinking about that, when you're trying to figure that out, I would ask you to think about it in terms of very specific skill deficits. Why is it that the student can't demonstrate skills that are commensurate with their peers? What are the skill deficits that they're missing and that therefore interfere with their ability to reach those outcomes or those peer skills, those skills that are commensurate with peers? So think about it this way. When you write your IEP and you're looking at that academic section, right? These are your headings for that area. You've got your reading, writing, listening, speaking, mathematical problem solving, right? We all know where we're talking. So we want our students to demonstrate appropriate skills in those areas, right? But sometimes they can't. Sometimes they're, they're unable to do that, which is why they would require SDI. So think about these headings and what might fall under each one of these headings. Now, what is listed here on this um, slide? Simply just examples. There's lots of others. And I know if I asked you to help me generate a longer list, you'd definitely be able to do that much better than, than I did when I created this. But for example, under reading, a, a, a potential skill deficit for a student who is not demonstrating reading skills commensurate to their peers might be because they have skill deficits in decoding, encoding, phonemic awareness, vocabulary, or, or a bunch of others. And it would be the same for each one of these headings. These could in include those potential skill deficits. So think about Bill. We have Bill here as an example. Bill is a student who is in the seventh grade, okay? And he is still reading at the fir first grade level. Because of that, because we want Bill to read at the seventh grade level, because that is commensurate to his peers, we're gonna work on that. We're gonna try to figure out why he's not there and what we can teach him, what are the skill deficits we're going to work on to get him there. However, the important thing around outcome and making it very skill focused is not to write the goal stating Bill will read at the seventh grade level, right? We know we want Bill to read at the seventh grade level because he's a seventh grader and that's what we want for everybody. So again, think about the why. So if you work with your team, your IEP team sits down and you have a, you know, you have a meeting and you say, you know what? the evaluation seemed to show that Bill has very weak decoding skills. He just cannot master this. We know his present level is he can decode words with a CVC word pattern with 100%. He's got that one, what's next? Well, maybe he cannot do CVC E words. So the present level around that specific skill is that he's able to do that with 23% accuracy. Well, that really shows us that Bill is struggling with that skill, for example, and therefore it's impacting his ability to read on seventh grade. So we're going to write the goal 
that he will increase his ability to decode words with that CVCE word pattern from 23% to 75%. So you can see for Bill how we're looking at working towards increasing his decoding skills, which will facilitate an increased reading ability, which will hopefully generate movement towards that outcome or that age appropriate expectation of being able to demonstrate reading skills that are commensurate to his peers. And here's how that would look on the IEP. So in blue is the, is the information that we've already discussed, right? We know that he's seventh grader, he has an SLD in reading, um, our IEP in terms of alignment, all of that was documented, his evaluations, his needs, everything was there. So they identified his team in section 4C, that decoding piece. They identified that as a skill deficit. You can see it's bulleted there. And then there's a how statement to support that, right? Because in section 4C, you need that, that specific skill deficit in the how statement. So then the team decided, yep, yeah, that makes sense. That seems to match with Bill. The evals support it. He's unable to reach that age appropriate expectation reading at the seventh grade level. So we're going to write this goal, okay? So that's how that would look on the IEP. And this is just another visual that represents this. We love the visuals. And for me, if I can see it visually, it helps embed it in my own brain. So this is how it might look, right? The outcome is again, wanting him to read at seventh grade level, we're gonna teach him decoding. We might also want to focus on fluency, spelling, phonemic awareness, whatever the evaluations seem to indicate Bill is lacking in terms of those skill specific areas. So that is an academic example. I think academics are a little bit easier to wrap my brain around. So we only have one. But does anybody have any questions about that? Did I go through it too quickly? Is there anything in chat we should stop to, to sort of look at? Or does anybody want to come off mute and um, have a comment or a question? There's nothing in chat as of right now. Nothing in chat. Okay. Anybody want to come off mute? Do you have anything you want to add or anything you need me to stop and go back to or clarify? No? Okay. Feel free to do this. Feel free to stop me if you need me to do that, okay? It's perfectly fine. All right, functional. I think this is where it gets tricky. This is where it got really tricky for me when I was teaching. And when I left, again, if you've joined us before, you've heard me tell this story, I apologize if you've heard it a hundred times. When I left, joined the department, the year I joined the department, my previous district was an audit which meant that they were looking at my IEPs. And as I got more, um, got a better understanding of how to write a really good IEP by working at the department, I realized, holy mackerel, my functional goals were all outcome. Every single one of my functional goals were outcome-based. I was writing goals in the functional area around age-appropriate expectations, okay? I'm gonna tell you exactly what I did. But when you're thinking about functional, these are the headings that we want to think about when we're developing our IEP. So cognitive, communicative, motor, adaptive, social, emotional, and sensory. And as with academic, we want all students to dem demonstrate those age appropriate skills, right? So functionally, that might mean that we're looking at making sure that all students attend, they come to school every day that they're expected to come to school. They complete their work. They make it through their day without being aggressive or biting or bolting or any of those unsafe or inappropriate behaviors. They're safe and they maintain attention to task. So again, as with academics, you've got your headers and then we just listed a couple of examples under each one of those headers that might be appropriate in terms of those skill deficits, okay? So Nina, Nina's a first grader. And Nina demonstrates aggressive behaviors. 
Now, even though as a team, we want Nina to stop being aggressive, right? We would not write a goal that states she will decrease aggressive behaviors. However, when I was teaching and I was working with students who were aggressive, that's exactly what I did. I would write a goal that said student will decrease aggressive behaviors from, you know, this to this, right? My present level would outline what their current performance was around the, the demonstration of aggressive behaviors. And then I would write a goal that would say that they would decrease to that less number. However, that's an example of an outcome, right? All students need to be at school without being aggressive. So what I needed to do instead was really think about the why, right? What's the skill deficit? Why is Nina being aggressive? Because that's the skill that she needs to learn to decrease the aggressions. So maybe Nina does not know how to use a visual to request help. Maybe, maybe Nina is a nonverbal student or a student who has very challenging communication, limited communication, and therefore she's unable to efficiently request help. When she needs help, that presents itself as aggressions. What I want you to think about too is all behavior is communication, right? So when a student is aggressive, they're trying to tell you something. It might be I need help. It might be I need a break. It might mean I'm hungry. It might mean when's recess, I want recess. It's our role as their teachers to try to figure that out. But in this example, Nina cannot use, cannot request help. And I want her to be able to do that. So I write my goal around that with the hope that if I teach Nina to request help, that will increase her ability to demonstrate decreased aggressions, right? And demonstrate a behaviors that are more commensurate with her peers, okay? And this is again, as with the academics, this is how it would look in the IEP. So the blue shows us that information we just discussed. She's a first grader with autism. We have evaluations to support it. We have the skill deficits documented in section 4A. And then in 4D, we have her how statement. We've got everything we need there. And then our goal, when prompted by an adult, give an SDI, Nina will independently pick up a help card, reach and release to a communicative partner when presented with situations that require her to do so, in 40% of opportunities as measured by observation and data collection. So that is an attempt to decrease her behaviors. With that said, we're going to need to maintain data around aggressions to make sure that teaching help is working. Okay, here's that visual around aggressions. We're gonna teach Nina to request help. I think the tricky part is really thinking about what, what are those skill deficits? What could they potentially be? And we've had lots of feedback when, when, when we're doing any sort of PD and we say, give us feedback, we look at the feedback. I was just in our feedback document this afternoon and we get lots of questions about, well, what could those skill deficits be? I can't tell you what those skill deficits are. That would really be up to the team, your team. Because, I mean, obviously, you know the students, I don't. But that would really be up to your team to think about what are those skill deficits. So you would need to meet with your BCBA, meet with your school psychologist, your OT, your PT, your speech path, everybody. Because, you know, I know when I was in the school, I was surrounded by phenomenal you know, related service providers. I had a great BCBA. I had a, I had a great team around me. So I was always saying to them, what do you think is going on? What is this about? Let's look at our data. Let's look at the evals. Can you do an observation and help me with this so that we could have a conversation about skill deficits? Questions so far? Am I moving too quick? We feeling okay? There are no questions in the chat. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. So this is new for us because we, we've talked a lot about outcome versus skill deficit. And then again, in the feedback document, 
it keeps coming up. People keep saying we need more help on outcomes. So, you know, my response to that was, you know what, if, if, if the field is still feeling fuzzy about it, then it is contingent upon us to help them understand it. So one of the things that I want you to, to, to think about when you're thinking about behavior um, and functional goals, really focus on the fact that a behavior is anything a person does, okay? Uh, behavior is a movement of an organism through space and time, and it must pass what's called the dead man's test. So if a dead man can do it, it isn't behavior, okay? Keep that in your mind for just a second. So if it meets the dead man's test, it is not behavior. So for example, we see goals from time to time when we review IEPs that say things like student will stay in their assigned seat, student will be quiet, student will stay laying down, student will listen without interrupting. They will, I, I have to tell you, I taught hands down all the time, which is not a great behavior, and student will have no aggressions, okay? What this means by the dead man's test is if a dead man can do it, it's not behavior. So staying in an assigned seat. You wouldn't want to teach staying in an assigned seat because, I mean, a, a, a dead man can, can stay in an assigned seat, right? It's not really a behavior. It's just, I mean, I, it, a pillow can stay in an assigned seat, right? A book can stay in a seat. So you really want to think about, again, the skills, skills, skills. I know I keep saying it, I apologize, but it's really about the skill deficits that will lend themselves. If I teach a child to stay in their assigned seat, that, that really does not give them, that really doesn't give them skills necessarily. If I'm, if I'm working on um, bolting, I could teach them to stay in their seat, but what is the skill that I've given them to replace bolting? Is staying in their assigned seat necessarily the skill I want to give them? Maybe, but my guess would be no. It's not the skill deficit. The deficit is not necessarily to stay in the seat. The deficit is to request help or read a visual schedule, whatever that, whatever the skill deficit is that lends itself to bolting, okay? So here are some potential examples. Instead of writing a goal that says student will stay in their assigned seat, maybe it's use a visual schedule to identify all activities in their day. If I've got a student who keeps getting up, maybe it's because they're going to the window because they're looking outside to see if anybody's out at recess because they don't understand when recess is. Maybe it's because they're uncomfortable and they need, um, you know, I need to talk to my OT about, um, you know, a, a therapy ball or a tea stool or something like that. So then instead of just teaching them to stay put, I might teach them to request a particular chair that's going to help them stay put. Instead of teaching, a, instead of writing the goal, be quiet. If the student is continually interrupting, I'm going to teach them to raise their hand or I'm going to teach them a skill to replace the interrupting. If I have a student who, you know, if I, I worked in preschool for a very short period of time and one, you know, we had students who just would not, they, they were supposed to rest. We had students who didn't rest. Well, I mean, I can teach them to lay down, but I would rather teach them how to use a visual timer so that they understand when they can get up, so that they understand when rest time is over. Not running, that's one I hear all the time and you know, I did it myself all the time. Don't run when they're inside, when students are to stop running. Well, what do you want them to do? Do you want them to walk? Do you want them to skip? Do you want them to do cartwheels down the hallway? What is it that you want them to do? That's what you wanna teach them. So maybe instead of writing, a goal that says child will not run inside, which is an age appropriate expectation. You write a goal that says child will follow visual cues to hold hands and walk beside staff when inside, if that's what the child needs. Keep hands down. Boy, I tell you what, I taught that one all day, every day for years. Hands down, hands down. But what did that teach them? Nothing. If students' hands are not in their lap, 
and they're poking their peer, is that because they're trying to say hello to their peer, but they don't know how? Well, then that's what I need to teach them. Is it because, you know, they're pulling at their pants? Then maybe it's a sensory issue and their pants are driving them crazy. And therefore, I need to teach them to request help. You know, think about why their hands are not down and teach them the skill that's going to replace that behavior. And then aggressions, that could be a multitude of things. But again, you would not write your goal around the child will stop aggressions or decrease aggressions. Teach them the skill that will replace that behavior. Does anybody have any thoughts about any of this or any other suggestions that you might want to teach to replace any of these behaviors in the left-hand column? You can either call them out or just put them in chat. Anybody have anything that they feel comfortable sharing? I'd love to hear it because we could add these to um, some of our visuals. We do have a request in chat um, okay. to talk more about the functional goal around elopement from the room. Okay. That is a great one. Absolutely. So if I were to add elopement to this left hand column right you would not want child will decrease bolting child will decrease or stop eloping why are they eloping the person who 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 put that in chat do you want to come on or put something in chat to tell us why you think they might be eloping Okay, they can't unmute for some reason, so hopefully they'll drop something in chat. Okay, that'd be great. Or does anybody else want to drop in chat or come off mute and say, you know, I mean, for those of us who have worked with students who, who do elope, who bolt, anybody have any thoughts about why that might be? I'd love to hear it. Um, they're thinking that it's mostly avoidance, um, avoidance of the task or something. And then okay. someone suggested requesting to leave the room. And I was going to say the same thing. I mean, I had students that would elope and oftentimes we would try to teach them to use a break card instead. Instead of taking off, ask us to take a break. Exactly. Um, that yeah, kind of thing. fantastic. Yeah, great. So if you think it's to leave the room, like Carly just suggested, a break card would be a fantastic um a fantastic skill to teach the child, you know, because if you don't teach them the skill, they're not going to just stop the behavior. Eloping works for them. They need a break and they run out of the room. Guess what? They got a break. It works. So if you don't want them to do that, you need to show them a different way. Okay. Um, were there any other comments in, in chat around that? Uh, yes, many people talked about taking a break. One suggested requesting to be done an activity. So maybe yeah. not a break, but just saying like, I want to be done this, do something else maybe. Yes. Um, and then we just have a comment. This feels very applicable to younger or more impaired students, but we struggle with teenagers and executive functioning needs like sustaining tasks, task initiation, inhibition, or prioritization. Yes. Yes. And I have to be honest, I only ever worked with littles. The oldest student I ever worked with was a fifth grader. I worked with the little. So that's sort of where my head tends to be all the time. But, you know, we had a comment. I can't remember. I don't even remember where, I, what, where the comment came from. If it came from a PD or if it came from on site, um, you know, somebody had made the statement that, you know, yes, I can teach a child to take a break, but then they're going to always want to take a break. And that's a very real concern. That's a legit concern. But what you would want to always think about doing is shaping that behavior very gradually, right? So I know when I used to teach take a break, I would honor it. And the recommendation would be to honor it every single time the child requests it, every single time, so that they can learn the power of this tool. And then eventually you start to shape that out, right? So you ask for a break. Thank you so much for asking for a break but I need you to put your name on your paper first and then you can take a break. Okay. Then I'm, you know, then I'm going to allow, you know, have that be the protocol for a little bit. Yep. I know you need a break. 
but I need you to do five problems and then you get your breaks so that you're gradually shaping it out so that it doesn't become something that the child um, takes advantage of and really abuses. But I would caution you against ever feeling like students shouldn't be allowed to take breaks. Think about yourself. Um, I was talking about this with my team the other day. You know, when I need a break as an adult, as a 56 year old adult, I walk away, you know, if I'm at work and I'm frustrated or I'm just, my brain is muddled for whatever reason, I might walk away and go get a drink of water or go turn my face to the sun because that helps. Or I might stop the task and move to something else, right? We do that as adults. And I think that it's really, really important for us to recognize that we ourselves are honoring those skills ourselves and we need to allow students to honor those you know we need to honor those for students as well okay so it's okay to to allow a student to take a break it's okay because we do it ourselves you know and it, it, of course it looks very different you know when I'm driving and I'm lost it's that old ah oh, geez I gotta turn the radio down so I can see where I'm going type of thing right you know I mean it's the same thing with students and we need to allow them access to those things that we allow ourselves, if that makes any sense. Thank you for sharing those that those those bits. So for that eloping piece, yes. Yes, figure out why and then write your goal around the reason why. The, the thing that the student is not accessing and it's resulting in that bolting instead, okay? And think about this too. If I have a student who's biting, and I had students who used to bite, never did I say to them, stop biting. I mean, I shouldn't say never, but that's not what I was teaching. I wasn't teaching them the skill of not biting, right? Because I don't want anybody to bite. I was teaching them skills that are going to be more effective than biting is. So again, it might be help, it might be break, it might be a sensory component. So I'm offering them a chewy instead, okay? Maybe they maybe they get gum at school, whatever it is that's very child specific. Um, attending school. I shared this example at another, um, at another, at a SAU last week, I think. My, my oldest daughter, who'll be, 30 this year, which blows my mind. Um, when she was very little, we had a we had a bout of preschool anxiety for her. And she would cry and she just it was awful. It was just awful. Any of you mamas who've ever had to leave your crying kid, it's horrible, right? And she would hang on me and hang on me because she just didn't want me to go. So after, you know, as a teacher, I kind of like, what is going on with her? She loves preschool. She loves her teacher. She loves her friends. What I did for her was I taught her, I didn't teach her to tell time, but I taught her and gave her a visual of a clock that looked just a regular old clock that said four o'clock. And what her preschool teacher helped her to do, she had this visual and her preschool teacher would say to her, oh, look at your visual. Is it four o'clock? Because my daughter learned and I taught her that when it was four o'clock, mom was on the way. I was on my way. Now, I didn't teach her I would be there at four because as you, if that just doesn't happen, that clean. But I taught her when the clock says four, mom is on the way. And that helped with her preschool anxiety. Okay. So think about that around attending school. If you have students who will not attend school or are not attending school, why is that? And how can you support their attendance at school? I could have dropped my daughter off, fried her little fingers off of me and ran to the car, but that doesn't teach her anything. And that doesn't help her with that behavior, okay? Um, so I wasn't teaching her to attend preschool. I was helping her understand when I, you know, when I would come get her, because that for her was the issue. Um, tantruming. You're not teaching students to stop tantruming, right? You're not, you're not teaching them the absence of tantrums. You're teaching them, again, skills that will facilitate that decrease. Same with aggressions. 
Okay, so always think about what you're teaching. Make sense? So back to bolting for just a quick second. You would be teaching potentially, take a break, right? You would be teaching potentially, I'm all done. You might be teaching potentially, this work is too hard, I need help, right? So thinking about that student and using your team to try to make sense of why the student is engaging in this inappropriate behavior. Typically, we drop a link to the procedural manual. We've got a link coming up, so you'll get it. Um, but in the procedural manual, if you do not have a copy of it, when we get to the slide that has the link, I would um, suggest that you grab it because the procedural manual has so much information in it around everything IEP and special education that you could ever want to know. It's a very user-friendly document, and on page 26 of that manual, it talks a lot more about outcome-based behaviors. So there's just, you know, a lot more information in it. But again, think just about what's the skill. If I want the student to do this age-appropriate thing, what's the skill that they're unable to do, and what am I going to teach them? and write your goal around that thing that you're teaching, not the age appropriate expectation, okay? With that said, I started to mention this previously, it is important that even though I was writing goals saying student will decrease aggression, for example, and then I shifted to, oh, I'm going, you know, student will request help. For progress monitoring purposes, I had to have data around the student's ability to request help. That was my progress monitoring data because that was tied to the goal and to the skill I was teaching. But I also had to maintain data around that aggression as well, right? Because if teaching the child to request help or take a break or say all done, whatever it is your skill is, if that does not impact that outcome, then I need to teach something else. It tells me that the SDI around that skill isn't working. So think about Bill, our seventh grader who's reading at first grade level. If I teach him decoding, as we identified in that example, but his reading skills don't get any better, maybe it's not decoding, maybe it's fluency, maybe it's comprehension. I need to stop and continue to figure out what else he might need. So always be thinking about the data sort of on, on both of those planes, your progress monitoring data, as well as your outcome data to make sure that the skill is being effective. Now, if I teach a student to use any of these tools, and we've talked about quite a few, right? Like a help board, I mentioned, um, you know, um, a chewy first then board, squishy, you know, therapy ball, tea stool, Whatever it is that I'm teaching the student to access, make sure that you document it here on section six of the IEP under accommodations and supplementary aids and services. Because if I have a student who does go out into the mainstream and they request a break with the general ed teacher and the teacher doesn't understand why they're doing this or doesn't understand the importance of them doing this, and this is my bolter, that, that, that student's going to bolt. Right. So make sure that it's on this part of the IEP and that you have conversations with staff who are going to come in contact with this student so that they understand, hey, if this student pulls out this break card, make sure you honor it. Because if you don't give this student a break, they're going to take one and that might not look the way we want it to look. So related services, outcome versus skill. So. We get this question a lot, especially from our speech paths, who panic when they think what we're saying is you need to, for example, write a goal for every sound pattern or um, you know articulation skill that you're teaching, and that's not the case for you. So it's really communication is that outcome, and you're teaching these skills. So just to sort of wrap it all up, 
just a reminder, again, don't write your goals around outcomes or age appropriate expectations. Really use your data, your team, you know, use the skills that you have. When I was working with students and they were tantruming again, I never said to them, stop tantruming, stop tantruming, stop tantruming. I wasn't teaching them to stop tantruming. I was using their first then board. I was pointing at their schedule so they understood what was next. I was showing them their token board so they knew what they were working for, right? Those were the skills that I was working on. And those were the skills that I would write my goals. Any questions, comments, other things you want me to think about or, or talk about before I go into resources? There's nothing um, in the chat. Okay. I have a quick question. Um, hi, this is Catherine. I don't know if you can see me. Um, my, my question is around the data collection. So let's say we're teaching this skill of recognizing when you're becoming overwhelmed and taking a deep breath or squeezing a fidget. Mm -hmm. um, or even your example of, okay, they're going to use their visual board. So would you go in and, and measure that yourself? Do you... Uh, yeah. get some sort of data collection sheet, some sort of tally that the TA is supposed to collect or, you know, um, how would that look in, mm -hmm. in that example? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Catherine. So you're talking about like a student who's in the gen ed classroom without you? Yeah, yeah. So that data I, collection piece? Right. Yeah, that's an ongoing challenge for sure, isn't it? Um, you know, what I would try to do is get in there a couple of times a week, once a week, whatever I know, I'm sorry, I'm saying that like that's so easy to do and I know it's not, but, um, you know, just trying to find time that I could either get in there myself, have an ed tech get in there and get, and get some data, or if the rate, if the gen ed teacher could do some tally marks for me, I would ask her to do that as well. And I know that that's much easier said than done, but I mean, if you're trying to track data, um, yeah, that would be important to try to do. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else? No? We, we just have a request in chat that um, if the DOE could do something that's more targeted to middle school and high school middle in the future, school. I'm assuming. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, the, the person who asked this question, thank you in terms of this topic specifically or in general? Like, could you tell me a little bit more about what you're looking for so that we can try to consider that? Yeah, thinking about those functional goals for high school kids where the behavior isn't elopement or biting or aggression, but it's more around um, self-regulation and, you know, task initiation so that they're completing work. We come up often with kids in the high school setting that aren't earning credits, and that's part of what we're targeting in their IEPs. But writing age-appropriate, socially appropriate, functional goals for um, some of those skills is really difficult because you want every student at the high school level to initiate tasks. You want all of them to have sustained attention. So how do we filter out the skill deficits and how are we writing goals that are not outcome-based um, with students where it would not be developmentally or socially appropriate to say like, here's your choice board or your first then board or those kind of things because they're you know, 16, 17, 18. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a very, very good point. Thank you. So I would ask you to think about like, what are the tools that other high schoolers use? Is it, you know, an assignment book? Is it accessing PowerSchool or some kind of um, online tool that other students access? No, you probably wouldn't want to have a 16, 17 year old in the gen ed setting toting around, a, you know, a token board or anything like that. But what are the tools that some of the other kids, some of the more, um, you know, typically developing students might use. And I had this question actually on site yesterday when I was doing a review and it was around um, functional um, behaviors because the student had a specific learning disability. So they were exhibiting some pretty, um, some off task and some, some very silly 
behaviors in the high school setting, but it was really tied back to their specific learning disability that for them, which, you know, high schoolers and middle schoolers are kind of goofy, right? So that's what this kid did. He, he this, this student would just kind of goof off and be silly in the class clown when the work was really hard. So for them, it really, and, and th this is just one very specific example, it doesn't answer the question broadly, but for this student, it really was about making sure that they had those academic skills because those behaviors were related to the fact that they didn't have those academic skills. Is that, does that make sense? Is that helpful at all? Or, I mean, we can certainly, I, I think your suggestion around high school and middle school is valid. Absolutely. And we as a team will take a closer look at it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, of course. Of course. And those of you who are in high school or middle school, I mean, if you have other, um, you know, situations like that, that you want us to think about, drop them in chat. We will grab them and we will absolutely think about them. We will absolutely. Um, and then if you want us to follow up with you specifically, put your email in there as well and we'll try to get back to you. I'm happy to do that. Okay. There's, there's also a little conversation going on about using a Google calendar and sending a Google form for the gen ed teacher to fill out. And Melissa has been asked to elaborate on that. I didn't know if she wanted to come off mute and explain a little more. Sure. So we just create a reoccurring calendar event every day. And in that calendar event, there's a link to the Google form where we're asking the teachers to very specifically either answer yes, no, or Likert scale questions and helping us determine one, what accommodations are being accessed in the classroom and two, um, are, is the student, you know, like how many breaks did they take? Did they complete, you know, 25, 50, 75, or a hundred percent of their work? Um, sort of doing some um, ongoing data collection to help supplement our occasional observations. That is phenomenal. That is phenomenal. Um, somebody on my team, can you please grab that? <laughs> And uh, we will give credit where credit is due, but that is a phenomenal way to think about it. Yeah, and that I love that 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 teamwork approach. It really makes all the teachers involved in that process. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, resources. We just blew them all to the end. If you've joined us, you've seen them. This is just our IEP visual, and we like to share it because it talks about alignment all the way from your evaluations and or your progress monitoring results through every component in the IEP and the importance of making sure that each area of the IEP touches the one before it and the one after it, right? So everything addresses the other thing, if that makes any sense at all. And this is a visual that represents that. This is the procedural manual and I lie, there is, does this, is this a live link? Yes. Yes, this is a live link, but you yes. do not have... I did drop it in chat earlier Perfect. also. Awesome, awesome. So if you do not have this, this manual, um, it, is, it is a phenomenal document. You can see by the table of contents what's involved, and it's very, very user-friendly, very easy to, to navigate around. These are the, this is a, a link to the Maine Unified Special Education Regulations. These are what we are tasked with following when we do everything that we do. This and of course IDEA. This document as, is not as easy to maneuver around in. It is very regulatory. It is very legal heavy. However, we want you to have it in case you need it. If you have questions about anything in it, feel free to reach out. Um, hopefully you all have access to this. Um, I can't see you all. I wish I could because I am presenting, but if I could, I would ask you all to do a thumbs up or raise your hand or something to indicate who has this document. Um, but this is, we call it the IEP quick reference document. I don't know why we call it that because it's like 14 pages long, so there's nothing quick about it. However, this document was something we created, I think two, maybe three years ago. It is something that we amend every year. 
And what this is, is this document reflects exactly what we look at for every SAU when we are um, doing reviews and monitoring. So my team is responsible for the supervision and monitoring piece around the state. So if your school is in cohort, which means you are due for our supervision and monitoring process, then this is what we look at. At the beginning of every year, our very first office hours, we go over this and every director gets an updated copy of this because we want everybody to know across the state what we look for every single year, even if you're not in cohort. So that when you come into cohort, you know exactly where we're, where, where we're at and what we've been looking at. But for your purposes, if you look at the left-hand column, that's the finding. That's the finding code. You don't need to worry about that. That's what we use, but we like to put it there in case you see it, you know what we're talking about. The location in the next column is where on the IEP we look for that finding. So for example, RAE1 is found, we look in section 4A of the IEP, and that is the results of, of initial or most recent evaluations of the child. And you can see that under the third column. And then there's the MUSER citation, so you know regulatory, where we're coming from. And this one also has an IDEA citation for those of you who are interested in the law. But the most important part for teachers or um, you know, service providers, those of you who write IEP goals, would be the criteria, that very last column. So for RAE1, when you are completing section 4A, what we would look for and what is compliant in that area would be if you include evaluations that support eligibility, you include the evaluation name and all evaluations must be dated. So this document in that criteria column goes through every section of the IEP and tells you exactly what needs to be there. I have a very good friend who I taught with for a long time, um, many years ago, she and I went out to dinner the other day and I said to her, do you have this? Are you using this IEP quick reference document? And she's like, well, I had no idea it existed until about a week ago. Um, she said, but I'm using it now. And what she found was that it streamlined her IEPs. She shared with me that she was writing way more than she needed to. So for her, this document was like, it was wonderful because it really helped her understand. I don't need to be writing as much as I'm writing. Jennifer and I were on site with a district yesterday, and I probably said that to the people I sat with and reviewed their IEPs over and over. You're working too hard. You don't need these narratives. You don't need all of this information. So Pay attention to that criteria column and it'll tell you exactly what you need to have in there. And that's all you need to have in there. This is just a clip from page one. That link will take you to the whole document. Um, are people, can people just plop in chat for me if they're using that? You're just a yes or a no, just, just so I can get a sense of that. And if you have any feedback about this document, I would love to know that as well. Um, if you find it helpful, if you think it's cumbersome, if you hate it and you used it for kindling, whatever the case may be, put it in put it in chat for me and let me know what your thoughts are around this document. Because again, this document is intended to be helpful. If it's not helpful, we need to know that so that we can so that we can amend it. So if you're using it, let me know. If you're not, let me know. And any feedback you might have, please please flood chat with that information. These are um, QR codes that will take you to our PD calendar. All of our professional developments have been recorded and they are linked to that second QR code with the accompanying PowerPoints, resources, laws, regulations, forms, reporting, everything is right there that you need. So feel free to access that information. It is all on our new uh, main DOE website, which is a phenomenal website. It is so much better than it used to be. So take a look. This is our PD calendar. You can see by those that are um, scratched out, we've passed those dates, but there are recordings for each one of those topics. And those are on the PD calendar, like I just articulated. And these are our upcoming with the registration links. Um, 
On April 10th, Jennifer, who is my law nerd, she loves everything about the law. She is doing uh, special ed law for general education teachers. So please feel free to share this with your teachers, your gen ed teachers, your peers, because we're really going to talk about the law and how it applies. A lot of times we get feedback saying you are preaching to the choir and we know that. So this is intended to help um, just explain the law more broadly. Um, we just talked about outcomes and same with spreading the news. May 8th, Jennifer is also going to be talking about consultation and related service goals. So please feel free to share that with your related service providers. I wanna be quick because we're running out of time and this is an important slide. As I mentioned, we take your feedback very, very seriously. That's why I've asked for it several times today. We have a document that we maintain. Carly does an exceptional job keeping up with it for me. Um, we go through it all the time and I pull things out. I pull out notes and we're always talking about, listen, we got feedback about this. What are we gonna do about it? This is another way you can give us some feedback. There's a link here to a feedback form. There's also a QR code to the feedback form. If you go in and complete this for us, you will get a contact hour um, for participating in this. And th there is a feedback form at the end of every one of our professional development opportunities. And we would ask if you would to fill those out and you will get contact hours for each one you participate in. So um, I think Carly will probably drop the link in as well, but this yes. is here. It's in chat. Fantastic. And then this is just a DOE mandated slide that we have to put in every one. Um, it's important. These are just different um, ways that you can find us, get some more information about DOE and the wonderful things that all the all the uh, teams are doing. And our contact information. Wow, 358, we did it. Um, one other thing that we like to offer to you all is um, here's our contact info. If you have questions, you're writing a goal and you're like, you know what? I don't know if this is outcome based or not. If you want, send us that goal. Do not send it to us in an IEP. Do not include any child identifying information because if you do, we are mandated by the Federal Department of Education to look at it through the lens of compliance. We don't want to do that. We want to look at it through the lens of offering feedback. So if you send it to us just in an email, like here's a goal I'm thinking about using. Student, blah, 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 blah. Just write it out in an email. We will um, give you feedback on it before you plop it into your IEP. We want you to be successful. We are part of your team. We are not out to ding you. We are not out to... Um, you know, chastise you for doing it wrong. If you have questions and you want feedback, that is our role and we are here to do that. The other day I got an email from a director who included, I don't know, like 10 goals from various case managers. And he said, can you look at these and give me feedback? And he just blew them up in an email and I gave the feedback and I sent them back. Um, so we are happy to do that with any of um, anything, you know, if you've got an eligibility form and you're not really sure of, you're working on a transition, you know, transition plan, and you've got questions, a goal, a present level, whatever. Send it to us very um, hypothetically, if you will, in an email, and we will give you feedback and um, provide you with that information. Holy mackerel. That was fast. That was speedy. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know. We don't have much time to do this. Are there any questions about any of that information or anything that you need me to go back and talk about again or anything? No? Okay. You've got our contact information. Please feel free to use it. We try to maintain, we maintain, we're pretty good. We try to maintain a pretty tight turnaround. 24 to 48 hours is pretty tight. We try to get it back right back out. So um, feel free to reach out to us at any time. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Thank Eric, you. interpreter, for joining us. Lovely to see you all. And um, I hope to hear from you again. Take care, everyone. Bye.